I am so excited to continue a series today about a process that leads to your best life. But before we get started, I just want to take a moment to say welcome to Rivers United Church. If I have not met you before or you're new to us, my name is John Hunter. I'm the lead pastor. And whether this is your first time or you've been with us a long time, I am so glad you took the time to be here today. The passage that we want to take a look at is the 23rd Psalm. It was written by a king. His name was David. And it's believed that David wrote the 23rd Psalm at the end of his life, reflecting back over his time as a shepherd boy. It's, it's a very poetic verse. It's one of the most poetic verses in all the Bible, in all of literature itself, to be honest with you. But it was meant to be more than that. It was meant to be a parable of life in which you could draw from the imagery, especially in some of the hardest and darkest times of your life. It's one of the reasons why we read the 23rd Psalm at funerals. But it was meant to be more than that. It, right in the middle of it, is a process that leads to our best life. And, and through that lens, I just want to read you the 23rd Psalm. It says this, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The pieces of imagery are astounding from the times that he leads us by green pastures and makes us lie down to the time that he brings us into his home and goodness and mercy shall follow us, which really to me represents having your best life possible. But between the still waters and your best life possible is a process where there's four images that we're looking at in this series. The first image that we took a look at was he leads us through the valley of the shadow of death from still waters to a valley of the shadow of death. Why would God bring us there? But we found in the first message that there's purpose in that valley. There's purpose in suffering and some of the things that we never thought could have purpose. God's God provides purpose for those things. And then we said, after we get through the valley of the shadow of death, there's a table set before us that all of God's blessings and all of the things that God wants us to learn and, and, and bring to us. And we talked about that, hey, if we came off of a long time, almost like being through this deep, dark valley or getting lost hiking or something like that, the food that we would want, and we had a good time talking about that last week. But then we said, but if you notice at the table, it's not just the table of blessing, but around that table, we're surrounded by our enemies. And we're thinking, why would God have our enemies surround us around his table of blessing? And we said that God wants to turn the tables on our enemies and cause them to feed us if we'll only understand that. So if you missed any of that, you can go back and listen to it. It's on our YouTube channel or on our website. But as we continue today, after we get past the valley, after we get through the table of blessings surrounded by his enemies and the lesson that we learned from that, it says this, that he anoints. It says, you anoint my head with oil. <laughs> now for a sheep back then, what David was referring to is, is they would put an ointment on top of the sheep's head that would oftentimes serve as a medicinal like help them if they had small cuts or anything like that. It would also keep all the uh, flies and all the other stuff off of them, provided much comfort. What I want to focus on, though, today is, is the head. And God could have picked many words, but between going through the valley, between the table of blessing and learning what enemies are all about, and next week we're going to talk about our cup overflowing and the blessings of God that leads to the best life possible. There's this small phrase right here. You anoint my head. My head. Of all the body parts, why the head? Why is the head important? I want to give you a couple things to write down today. And so I would recommend maybe take some notes. But the first one is this. is Why is the head important? And it's this, because it controls the body. <laughs> and by the way, whoever has control of your head, they can control you. A 90-pound girl, and I've watched this before, a 90-pound girl soaking wet can control a 1,000-pound horse. In fact, she can control a 2,000-pound horse if she has control of their head. Can I tell you something? Whoever has control of your head, whether they're weaker than you, whether they're not as smart as you, they control you. And there's not much you can do 
without your head. <laughs> a doctor will tell you, if you go to a doctor, he'll say, hey, man, we can replace almost every vital organ between your kidneys and liver and lungs. You can even replace your heart, but you can't replace the head. Without the head, nothing else works. <laughs> That's amazing. What I'll tell you that God is saying is this, is that, that he anoints your head and as the runoff from the anointing happens, it fills your cup, which means this, that without your head, without your head being anointed, you will never have the blessings of God. In fact, I'll have you write this down. I wrote it down this way. My cup is only catching the residue that runs off of my head. I would say this is very important that you'll never truly understand the blessings of God until you understand the importance of what he's trying to teach us through this anointing of the head. So we're going to talk a little bit about it. Before we get into it, though, I want to, I want to share with you some problems that we have. And the first problem that I see is this, is that, number one, the enemy wants your head. The enemy wants your head. <laughs> Can I tell you one thing? Is that I think a lot of us don't realize we're in a fight. Now, this is for the follower of Jesus. But, but if you're not a follower of Jesus, you pay, pay attention to this, and you'll say, hey, man, maybe you'll want to be one by the time you finish listening to it. So you're welcome in on this dialogue. But for the follower of Jesus, in Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about that we are in a battle. And it talks about putting on spiritual armor <laughs> that the enemy is trying to attack us. But if you didn't know there was an enemy... He comes and he attacks you, and then you're confused, and you're left where you don't understand what's going on. But what the enemy wants is your head. <laughs> because he knows if I can control your head, I can control the rest of you. But see, he doesn't want your head for a good purpose. He, the enemy has come to steal and to kill and to destroy you. <laughs> and you have to understand that. that he, what he uses in his, in his tool for your head is this, is your imagination that he wants to use the dark things and the what-ifs of life and suppose this happens and the projection of all the bad things that can happen and the shadows that we talked about last week that you're coming through the shadow of death. The, sh the valley of the shadow of death. And as you come through that valley, there's shadows in that valley. And the enemy wants to use it to confuse you. I think there's somebody that's listening today, that the enemy has come after your head. And, and maybe you've had something that happened in your life where you've been abused, and now you're confused, and maybe you're frustrated and angry or fearful, and, and you don't know, how do I get my head back? And today we're going to tell you that God wants to anoint your head. It doesn't matter what's happened in your life. God wants to help you through this process and help you overcome the enemy. But you have to realize the enemy is after you. The enemy wants your head. That's the realization you have to have. The second thing I wanted to point out to you was this, is that most people are governed by their heart instead of their head. <laughs> most people are governed by their heart instead of their head. You know what I mean by that? That a lot of times people are governed by their feelings and how I feel and my passions. And, and we might even be thinking, after all, I, I'm more of a heart person than a head person. I'm more of a feeling person. And there's nothing wrong with feelings. But when you allow your feelings, when you allow your heart to lead you, then there's a problem. And let me explain something to you. God didn't anoint your heart. He anoints your head. He gives you power through your mind, not just your heart. And if you let your feelings guide you, it sounds so good, doesn't it? That it's all about my heart. But can I tell you what Jesus said about the heart? He said that out of the heart comes wickedness and murder and adultery and all kinds of bad things. That's what he said in the book of Matthew. And he wants you to have this thing. You see, what happens to us is this, is as we let our emotions dictate to us, we forfeit our purpose that God has for our life because of our feelings. If I put it a different way, I would say this. We forfeit our purpose because of hurt feelings. In fact, I might, I might be somebody listening right now that's saying, the reason why I'm not serving, the reason why I'm watching this online and I'm not in church today is because I got hurt feelings and I'm kind of out because they made me feel that way. <laughs> you see, God didn't promise 
that your feelings and the facts would line up. He just didn't do that. A headless life. We're living a headless life because, because we haven't separated our feelings from the facts. We can't be governed by our feelings. We can't be governed by our heart. We have to be governed by our head. So number two, most people are governed by their heart instead of their head. That's a problem. And the third one is this, having a heart experience in a head fight. Having a heart experience in a head fight. You see, the enemy is coming, and a smart enemy will go after your head. He, he wants to cut your head off and leave you with your feelings. <laughs> That's a fact. You see, don't tell the enemy how you feel. A lot of people do that. A lot of people come at it from the perspective of, hey, I'm going to tell the enemy how I feel and almost negotiate with the enemy on the basis of feeling. And it doesn't work that way. i got a question for you today, and it's this. Are you busy managing your feelings and the feelings of other people? That your heart has interrupted what you have decided you want to do. That you want to do this, but you're being led by your heart instead of your feelings, and the enemy is winning. Because he would love for you to have a heart experience in a head fight. <laughs> Can I tell you what God wants for you today? God wants you to get your head back. God wants to give you your head back. God wants to anoint your head no matter where you've come from, no matter how much guilt you have. That's a feeling, by the way. That guilt is keeping you from the purpose that God wants to have in your life. He wants to anoint your head. Some of us, it's regret. Some of us, it's resentment that we're so angry. I don't know that God could. Or maybe it's a feeling of fear. I don't know what feelings might be holding you back, but God is saying, I want to give you your head back. In fact, he's saying it this way. I want to anoint your head. Okay, so how do we get our head back? Three things. Three things I want to give you today to get your head back. Number one, change your attitude. <laughs> that the first thing you got to do is change your attitude. The attitude is so important. I'm going to give you a couple of verses that, that, that you can hold on to. The first one comes from 1 Peter, and it's instructions to the church. That means if you're a follower of Jesus, this was written directly to you. And he says this in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. He says, be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. It's a lot like what we just talked about, right? that your enemy, the devil, is after you. And a lot of people just don't realize it. And he's saying, but, but in order to overcome him, in order to get your head back, you have to be what? Sober-minded. Now, any of us that have had problems in alcohol with the past, then, then we know when you're over-drink and intoxicated with either alcohol or drugs, that, that you don't make the best decisions. And some of us have the scars to prove that. But can I tell you, it's not just alcohol. That you can actually be drunk with anger. That anger could lead you to a place where you go, I didn't mean to do that, but I was so angry and I was intoxicated by it. And you don't have a clear mind. That you could be, that you could be intoxicated with pride. You could be intoxicated with guilt or fear. That we could be intoxicated with other things and our feelings could rule over us. And he's saying, I want you to get your head back. Be alert. Be sober-minded. I want to give you an example of that that comes from the book of Genesis. That's an amazing illustration of it in Genesis chapter 4. And in Genesis chapter 4, we find that after man had sinned in the Garden of Eden, and if you want to read about that, it comes in chapters a few chapters before that in Genesis chapter 3, where man sinned and, and ate of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, and so God told Adam and Eve they couldn't live in the garden anymore, and then they would have children. And so they had two sons, Cain and Abel, and they had taught them that, hey, God said that we need to make sacrifices. And the sacrifices God taught them was about animals and lambs and stuff like that, that they were to sacrifice to God, which was a picture of Jesus to come. But Cain kind of didn't understand that, and so he offered to God the food because he was a person that grew a lot of food, and he was really proud of it, and he offered it to God, and then God corrected him. But I want you to see what happens next in Genesis chapter 4, and in verse 5, it says this, 
But on Cain, in his offering, he did not look with favor. That's talking about God. That Abel made a sacrifice and it was good. But but on Cain, he didn't he didn't think that that had favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. I would say that shows an attitude, right? His face was downcast. Verse 6, Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? Why do you have an attitude, right? You got a teenager? You understand what I'm talking about. You know what I think God's saying this to you today? Why are you angry? Right? You've been corrected by something you did, and you misunderstood But God wasn't mad that you made a mistake or he wasn't holding that against you. He's saying, but why did you get angry at me? Because I told you what I needed you to do. Because God has a purpose for these sacrifices and why they needed to be a certain way. But Cain got mad. I want you to show you verse 7. It says, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door and it desires to have you, but you must rule over it. I want to tell you about Cain, that Cain was intoxicated with pride. You see, he felt like, man, I made this great thing, and then you gave my brother more attention than me, and you said what I did wasn't good, and there was all kinds of stuff, pride and envy and jealousy and anger, and anger at God for being corrected because he misunderstood. You see, he had an emotional moment. When God was trying to teach him something, he was trying to give him a truth. And I find this with a lot of people. That our problem is this, is that we're coming at it from a heart experience instead of understanding that God is trying to show us something to correct our life. It wasn't personal. Sometimes we do that. I got a couple questions that I'd like to ask you just to see if any of this makes sense to you. The first one is this, is when someone corrects you, or another word for correction is criticize, at work, do you become defensive? <laughs> right? It, if somebody asks you something at work, do you become defensive? Here, here's another way I, I would put that. Why, why are we loyal to ineffective methods? Why is it that it seems like we date effectiveness, right? We go, hey, we know this works, and I kind of date that, and I kind of see it, but we marry ineffectiveness. We keep doing the same thing and expecting a different result, right? <laughs> It's called circular logic, right? Loop, it loops. Have you noticed that? That sometimes we do the ineffective things, that our boss corrects us at work, and we take it personal. Let me ask you a question. When, when, when your boss corrects you about being late or something else, is your first response to go around to everybody else and say, how dare he say that? He's late for other things. But have you noticed how ineffective that is? <laughs> that we basically marry ineffectiveness and we, and we go around and we talk about the boss to everybody. How dare he say that to me? I can't believe he said it like that to me. But, but we're not getting a raise. We're not getting ahead in life because we're not listening to that correction. We're just being defensive about it. Or, or at home, if your wife did something and, and you went off on her, how much has that ever worked? You going off on her, how, how is that effective? It's not. Or, or, or maybe, you're, maybe it's you, you know, your husband. And, and, and you're going to put him straight. But how many times when you put him straight and you say it in that way, has that ever worked? You see, we don't learn. It's circular logic. We keep doing the same thing and expecting a different result. And, and it doesn't work. <laughs> now, I want to give you an example of, of a person where it did work. So we might be able to change some of that behavior or we're never going to truly have the blessings of God. He's going, I want to give you your head back, but you got to change your attitude. Hmm. Here's an example of one that did work. It comes from Luke chapter 15, and it's based on a, a parable that Jesus taught. So he picks these words very carefully. It's about a father who had two sons, and in Luke chapter 15, he, he's, he, really Jesus is explaining how God sees us. And right in the middle of it, he says, hey, it's like a father who had two sons. And the youngest son, he, the, the father divides up his inheritance. And the younger son goes out and he squanders his money on wild living and partying. And then when he runs out of money, it says that he wakes up in the pig pen of life, basically. <laughs> Anybody ever done that? And he has no money because he didn't, he didn't use it to better himself. He didn't invest the money. He spent it all on, on frivolous stuff, and now he has no life skills. And all the friends that were partying with him, they don't want anything to do with him when he has no more money. 
and he's in a foreign country, and he finds the only job that he can get is in a pig pen, and he's eating the pig food. <laughs> kind of reminds me of when we were broke and eating ramen noodles. Some, some of you guys know what that's like. Uh, same thing. And then it says this, and, I, and this is the part I want you to see. It says, when he came to his senses, can, can you circle that? When he came to his senses, can I tell you what that is? That's getting your head back, right? He changed his attitude. He came to his senses. How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. Verse 18, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. You see, when he came to his senses, when he changed his attitude and it led to action and he came back to that father, can I tell you how the father greeted him? You can go back and read the story. It's one of the most powerful stories in all the Bible. The father greeted him by throwing his arms around him and killing the fatted calf and giving him a ring and sandals on his feet and bringing him back dignity. That's what God thinks about you. He wants to give you your head back, but you got to change your attitude. That's a great example. Number one, you got to change your attitude. The second thing I see to get your head back is this. You have to change what you say. You have to change what you say. Jesus is probably the best illustration I could give on how to do this. When Jesus was tempted by the devil, it's found in the book of Matthew chapter 4. Before he started his ministry, it says that he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and then the devil, Satan, came and got him and took him into the wilderness. And he tempted him, and he started with food and some other things that he tempted him with. But I want you to see how Jesus answered Satan, because if we get this, it might just change our life. He said this to him, Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4, Jesus answered him, it is written. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 7, Jesus answered him, it is also written. This is a second temptation. And on the third one, Jesus answered him, away from me, Satan, for it is written. Do you see his approach with the devil? He did not approach the devil with feelings. He didn't say, hey, you need to feel for me or how dare you do this to me and, and approach the devil. Because can I tell you something? The devil and the enemy doesn't care about your feelings. It's the wrong approach. You don't approach a knower. You don't approach a knower with your feelings. It won't make sense. By the way, the devil has no compassion for your feelings. He doesn't care how you feel. He wants to cut your head off and leave you with your feelings. Somebody needs to hear that today because you're stuck in your feelings. So you can't have a soft head. You can't have a soft head and make it. It's the reason why if you read Ephesians chapter 6, the full armor of God, and I, I would recommend that you do, it says to put on the helmet of salvation to protect your head. Now, I've done some stuff, and we had these guys come out with the armored combat league that meets in our area that they dress up like knights and stuff. And if you don't wear that helmet when somebody's hitting you with a sword, I got to tell you, it hurts. It could, really, it could actually kill you. But with the, with the helmet, it protects you. Can I tell you what the helmet represents for us? The word of God, the gospel of God, that he wants to give you his word, just like with Jesus, as it is written. And you own that and you start to apply that to your life. You see, what God wants you to do is repeal and replace the lies of the devil with his word. That's so good. That's so good. I want to give you another example. That's what Jesus did. There's another example found in Matthew chapter 9. And it's about a lady but it's, it's only a, a, a couple lines, it's only a couple verses long, the story of this lady. Yet we find this lady mentioned in three of the four gospel accounts. I would say that's pretty important. Here, here's what it says about her, verse 20. Just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came behind him, that's Jesus, and touched the edge of his cloak. So Jesus had big crowds and people were being healed and it was very hard to get to him. And this lady had a problem bleeding. It's believed that she hemorrhaged. It was a serious problem with bleeding for 12 years and, and was probably dying. And she comes to him for healing and can't talk to him. But what she does is she reaches out and touches his cloak. This is the part I want you to pay attention to, though. She said to herself, if I only touch his cloak... I will be healed. She did what? She said to herself. Could you circle that? 
Could you write that down? Could you tattoo that on your arm? <laughs> what you say to yourself? You see, you have to change how you talk to yourself. You might not realize that the Bible teaches that, right? Your internal monologue, you have to take control of it. A lot of times people don't realize that they can because you'll hear a voice in your head that says certain things and you have to replace that with the word of God. That's exactly what she did. I believe in him. I have a feeling there was people that told this lady, you're disabled, Jesus don't have time for that. You know what, you had that problem for 12 years, you need to just live with it, there's this big crowd, there's obstacles, you're never going to get healed. But the reason why she did was, when she got there and it looked impossible, she said to herself, let me ask you a question, what do you say to yourself? What, what are the other things that are going through your head? You see, some of us have an internal monologue, I can't do it. It can't be done. I'll always be this way. There's no way to make this change in my life. I can never be free. God could never forgive me for the things that I've done. You're, not, you're worthless. You, you can't do it. <laughs> you know what I think God wants to do? He wants to replace that internal monologue with His Word. Replace it with what He speaks over you. The promises that God has that He wants to prosper you. That God is for you, not against you. And you start to replace those things, maybe even words that were spoken over you, that that person is dead and gone, yet they're defining your life. And God wants you to say and change what you're saying about yourself by repealing and replacing those lies with his truth. And when you do, you know what's going to happen? You're going to get your head back. There's one last thing I want to tell you about getting your head back today, and that's this. Number three. Give God control of your life. That's what this really leads to. We're going to talk more about that next week. The, the best illustration of getting control and giving control of God was found when Jesus ascended back into heaven. If you read the, the gospel accounts, you'll see that at the end of them, in every one of them, they tell the same story of Jesus Christ coming and dying on the cross for the sins of the world and then rising from the dead and then appearing to them and spending time with them and then he goes out to the Mount of Olives and he ascends back into heaven. Now that's a problem for the church because the head of the church isn't a pastor. It's not me. It's not another pastor. The head of the church is Jesus Christ. And without the head, what does the body do, right? And he tells them, I want you to go and share the good news about what you have. But before you do, I want you to go and wait for the power of God. You see, some of us are trying to live out our Christian life without the power, without the head, without the filling of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, you might not understand what that means, but it really means this, the empowerment. It means to give him the controls of your life. And when you do, your cup will overflow. You will have blessings and God will do more than you can dream or think or ask with your life. But you have to give him the control. Let me ask you a question. Are you, are, are you giving him the control? Or are you letting your feelings control you? Can I put it different? Are, are you giving God the control of your life? Or are you a people pleaser and whatever people say, what you do goes up and down? In fact, in fact, you serve whether if people like what you do or they give you praise, then you're good. But if they don't or they hurt your feelings, then you're out. And God is saying, I want to give you your head back. I want to ask that question a little bit different. And I wrote this down so I wouldn't forget. Are you so busy managing emotional relationships that you don't have time to think the thoughts you need to think to go to the places you need to go? <laughs> Can I say that again? Are you so busy managing the emotional relationships that you don't have time to think the thoughts you need to think to go to the places you need to go? <laughs> Isaiah the prophet said it this way. He said, you will keep him in perfect peace. All who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. <laughs> Did you see what he said? Perfect peace. Your thoughts. Can I tell you about thoughts? Thoughts come from the head. <laughs> Fix your thoughts. Fix your mind. Control. Don't, don't be controlled by Get your head back. You see, what I think is there's a shift coming. God wants to give you your head back. That's what I know. God wants to give you your head back. In another place, you know what he says? 
And then you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. <laughs> isn't that great? The truth will set you free. That's a head thing, isn't it? God wants to give you your head back. Next week, we're going to talk about that, that our cup will overflow. But before your cup can overflow, here's what you got to have. You, you want to know what you got to have? He says, you anoint my head with oil. Because here's what I know. Your cup can only catch what runs off of the head, the anointing, the glory of God. And you might not get all of that today, but here's what I do think you can get. Would you give your mind to God? If you will, I got to tell you what he's going to do. He's going to overflow your life like you can't believe. Can I pray for you today? Let's pray. Father God, we come before you today, and Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity to share. And I pray that, Lord, that there's a person that I believe their mind is clouded, that maybe they're stuck in their feelings, feelings of guilt, Maybe it's feelings of anger or regret or stuff that people did and it's all skewed and all clouded and the enemy wants nothing more than to keep them that way, to keep them from having their head. But you said, then we'll know the truth and the truth will set us free. God, I pray today, give us our head back and then anoint our head as we offer control back to you. I pray for somebody that's been in bondage and so scared and so defined by what lies people spoke over them that today they'll give you those lies and you'll change them with your truth. That they'll realize for the first time you're for them, not against them. That you could forgive all sins. That there's nothing that could not, that would keep you from them. I'm praying they can take that into their life. Lord, I pray for the Christian that's gotten off course. That somewhere along the line they got hurt feelings. And instead of dealing with their feelings, maybe they did like Cain and, and, and they're downcast or somebody said something hurtful. Maybe it was something that was true and they need to deal with that. Or maybe it's something that's not true and they need to replace that. But God, help us not to allow our feelings to dictate our life anymore. God, please anoint our head with your oil so that our cup will overflow. Father, we'll give you all the honor and glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen.